Welcome to Speak Freely. Your host for today is Jim Fishwick. Jim is an award-winning theatre maker and experience designer who specialises in impro, improvised events, and interactive and imp immersive performance. Kia ora koto kato. Welcome to Speak Freely, presented by Impro Melbourne. This is the third in our series, and this one comes at the end of October. It's our Halloween special. Please welcome, please welcome yourselves to Spook Freely, if you will. Spook, I, I, Spook Freely? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, Speak Freely is presented by Impro Melbourne. Impro Melbourne is on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and through them to all First Nations people of Australia. Sovereignty was never ceded. I personally am in Kirikiriroa in Aotearoa, where Waikato Tainui, uh, Tangata Whenoa, Tihe Mori Ora, Enga Mana, Enga Reo, Ero Rangatirama, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. I'm very excited to have you all here for this third installment of the Speak Freely series. This time we are visiting the Americas with guests from North and South, and some of them are currently uh, in entirely different continents altogether. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. We are going to start by asking some questions of our own to the panelists, but then we want to get to your questions. What do you want to know? What's your burning improv question that you need to get out there? Or what's your mild, curious question that you just want to get someone else's opinion on? You can ask questions by hitting the Q&A box at the bottom and typing in your question there, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. But I am not driving this train solo. I have a co-driver with me, former artistic director of Clockfire Theatre of the Dynasty Soap Opera of Impro Melbourne, is the author of Improvise Freely, the one and the only Patty Styles. Welcome, Patty. Hello, toot toot. Let's drive the train. <laughs> Look, sometimes you just start a sentence and you don't really know where it's going to end. What? Improvise? What? <laughs> How are you, Patty? I am great. I'm so excited by today's panelists. I feel yeah. like we're getting people from different places of my impro family. So it's really exciting. That's great. For people who haven't been to an improvise freely, sorry, to a speak freely event before, the speak freely event is uh, tied into the release of your book, Improvise Freely. Would you like to say a few words about the book? Yeah, uh, so Improvise Freely is uh, having a look at the impro rules um, that are being taught. And I'm not a fan of them. Um, I don't think that the impro, impro rules are actually serving us in our impro work. Uh, and I just wanted to open up a conversation, have a discussion, have people question them, think about them, talk about them, debate them, um, and then make decisions for themselves. So not to just follow something because they were told, but to actually go, hey, does this serve me? So Speak Freely is an extension of that where we're asking people to join a panel and we're asking them questions that maybe aren't always or often asked on improvisation panels to basically connect world impro, to have different ideas, theories, uh, histories of work, what people are doing, try to bring this all up and bubble it so that we just really see this wonderful, incredible art form that we're in. Well, let's get into it. I'm, yeah. I'm excited. So we will now introduce the panelists for today's Speak Freely. First, joining us from the USA is Joe Bill. Joe has been improvising since 1977, including training with Del Close for a number of years. He was one of the founding members of Annoyance Theatre Chicago, was the director of corporate training at IO Chicago for 15 years, and a teacher and guest artist in residence at the Second City Conservatory and Training Center. He's worked with a number of improvised comedy festivals in and theatres and festivals all over the world and at every major improv festival in the United States and has a number of duo shows with partners like Jill Bernard, Stacey Halal, Lee White, and Patty Stills. Will you please welcome Joe Bill? 
Hello! <laughs> I was just catching up on some reading before the holidays. Do you have it open to the page with your quote in it, or is that... Um, I opened it to a random page, and it's, uh -huh. I opened to questions, the keys to open doors. And so, in the divining sense, I feel like this is going to be my opening mantra. How are you, Jim? I'm very well, Joe. Thank you very much for joining us. Nice to see you. Our second guest is Christy Bruce. Christy was born and raised in Calgary, Canada. At the age of 16, she started studying with the world-renowned impro teacher, Keith Johnson. She toured around Canada, Europe, and Australia before being hired by Second City in Toronto. She's performed on Broadway in Private Lives and spent 10 years as Mimi in Blind Date, where she performed in multiple countries, including London's glittering West End. She has a number of TV credits, including Schitt's Creek, Handmaid's Tale, and Orphan Black. Would you please welcome Christy Bruce? <laughs> oh, oh, hello. I was just just reading, just doing a little light reading on a on a Friday night here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. How are you, Jim? What an amazing coincidence. Everyone's reading the same. I'm very well. Thank you very much, Christy. <laughs> Our next guest from Colombia is Daniel Orantia. Daniel is an artist passionate about the transformative power of performance. He created and co-directs the Picnic Theatre Group in Colombia, as well as the Monkey Fest International Festival, currently in its ninth edition. Over the last 15 years, he's blended performance and visual arts, creating and presenting a non-stop series of shows and workshops, including Speechless, a wordless show driven by music, and his latest show, the fortune teller, both of which have taken Danielle on journeys around the world. Please welcome Danielle Orantia. Hello. Hello, how are you? Can you hear me? Can you see me? I can hear you. I can see you. It's, it's great on both counts. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, event. I'm very happy to see faces I know and to get to know new faces. It's a face-based show. <laughs> Lovely to have you, Daniel. Next is Sergio Paris. Sergio is an actor, director, and theater teacher specializing in impro. He studied at Escuela Municipal, apologies, Escuela Municipal de Arte Dramatico de Argentina and at Escuela de Generos Teatrales Puros. Since 2003, he has led the company Keto Impro de Peru, and in 2020, he co-created Finde Impro, which produces virtual shows that Sergio also acts and directs in. He has taught and performed in international festivals in Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Colombia, Puerto Rico. The list just goes on and on. Will you please welcome Sergio Paris? Hola, hola, ¿qué tal? Este, me hubiera encantado estar leyendo también el libro de Patty Styles, pero como está en inglés no lo entiendo, entonces por eso no lo estoy leyendo todavía, pero estoy acá dispuesto a, a charlar con, con traducción. Gracias por la invitación. In sí. this conversation, uh, Daniel will be translating for Sergio at points. Daniel, would you mind? Passing on she says he said. will love to be reading uh, Patty's book, but he doesn't speak English, so he's happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Um, and maybe Improvise really might make its way into different languages at some point. So who, who can say? Who can say? But we are very grateful to have you here, Sergio, um, I, who is joining us from Madrid, where it's currently 2 a.m. So we are doubly grateful to have you here. And our final guest is Elise Rodriguez. Elise is a Cuban-American performer, teaching artist, and trainer. She left the world of law to pursue the creative arts and now performs and teaches around the world. She joins us from Portland, Oregon, USA, where she works at Curious Comedy Theater in a range of roles, including CFO, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and as a teaching artist. She also co-hosts The Elise and John Show, a podcast showcasing and foregrounding creative BIPOC voices and culture with an improv twist. Will you please welcome Elise Rodriguez? Oh, hey, didn't see you there. I was uh, reading this uh, very, very riveting improv book. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you all. Um, same thing that Danielle said, 
very happy to see familiar faces and make new friends. Excellent. We're very glad to have you here. Um, so for the first part of this panel, Patty and I have some questions that we're going to throw out to people, going to see what people want to say. And then later on, we will get to your questions, uh, audience. So please do put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, the first question uh, I have is for uh, Danielle, for Sergio and Christy. The, so when people, especially in Australia, we talk about, uh, if we talk about American improv, and this is the case in lots of different parts of the world, when people talk about American improv, that usually means the USA and excludes Canada, Central and South America. But those countries all have their own long, rich improvisation histories. So when people use uh, American improv to talk about the USA or talk, say things like improv is an American art form or improv was invented in America, uh, how does that uh, feel to you? How does that make you feel? What, what are your thoughts on that? I'm just gonna say that Joe is looking very hungry at this question. <laughs> No. I've actually I've got to say in Canada I've, I've never heard that but as a Canadian um, I think we're very used to all things being American and you just kind of I don't know when I Patty and I both started at Loose Moose in Calgary and that was much more of a little bit of a bubble when I moved to Toronto that was the first time I actually started hearing about American styled improv like especially like Chicago based improv and it, that was the first time I actually had that door creaked open. So for me, and by that time I was already in my mid twenties. So I think there was so much brain juice that was solidified that I don't think, yeah, for me, I don't think it actually ever really um, played a part in any of my process. Daniel, do you have a, anything you'd like to add here? I think there's a, a big discussion around that theme because there's this whole thing of are we like a whole continent like America but in some schools like in South America they teach us that is America is divided in two like North America and South America <laughs> but in the US people are taught that there's three Americas North America, Central America, and South America. So it's all a big discussion. I think nobody in, in uh, South America says like, I am South American, unless it's a very specific <laughs> question or you're talking about that. So for me, it's like, I know that when people are talking about American improvisation is mainly improvisation made in the US. Yes, that's mm. my thoughts about that. <laughs> but do you, uh, uh, because when we say American, it can exclude Canada and South America, because the assumption is America means American, as in the United States. Yes. Do you feel excluded? Not, not really, but I think it's a, an interesting question because it has been a thing in the last years where in South America, we don't call Americans Americans. We mm. call them gringos uh, <laughs> because we are Americans too. So it will be like, it's very strange to call them Americans, mm. at least in Colombia or, or this region that I've been traveling to i never seen people going los americanos or the americans is more like gringos the, mm -hmm. and gringo comes from green go that's what they will be shouted at to jump out of the out of the helicopters in vietnam when they were when the helicopter will land and they will have to jump out of the helicopter into battlefield the guy will shout, green go, green go, green go. And uh, people in Vietnam will hear this 
gringo, gringo, gringo is that they are here. So it, the story that I know is that it comes from, from that thing. But yes, I think nobody that I know really is offended by people calling impro, American impro. Mm -hmm. But it's also not a thing that I think I am related to. Mm. Yes. Does Sergio uh, have anything he'd like to say? Sergio, ¿tienes algo que quieres compartir acerca de, de la... Siento, me siento raro compartiendo tantas cosas con lo que acaba de decir Daniel, pero, pero es así, siento que, 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 que hablar de la improamericana es, es como muy grande eh, y no nos incluye a todos. Y... Y, y por ahí es como, como hablar de la impro en, en, en América, se habla según desde qué lugar se vea, pero me parece que sobre todo se habla de la impro eh, norteamericana. ¿no? Eh, hay otra impro que, que se hace en Sudamérica que, que no sé si está incluida en, en, en ese concepto. Eh, eh, también un segundo para traducir. He's saying that the... American Impro is too kind of a big term that includes all America, but he feels that that term is specifically for North American or US based improvisation. And the improvisation done in South America is, is very different. Uh, and he believes that that term does not include that sort of a style or way of approaching improvisation. Sí, Sergio, ¿algo más? No, eso, eso, eh, por ahora eso. Ok, that's it. <laughs> um, excellent, as, as a follow-up, um, Joe or Elise, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to add on Phrases like improv is invented in America um, and how they resonate with you. Yeah, leave it to us to also colonize improv. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, there are so many conversations around uh, inclusive and exclusive language. Um, and especially here right now in terms of improvisation and any space where people gather. Um, I would say that in my experience, outside of people who frequent festivals that bring in international acts or outside people who are traveling outside of the United States, um, I don't think that American improvisers are often thinking about what South American improv might look like, nor what Canadian improv might look like. I think it's pretty self-centered <laughs> is the best way that I can put it. Outside of people that, that have the experience of being exposed to teams from outside or groups from outside or theaters from outside of the US is what I would say. So I think that definitely some education and some exposure would be nice. And I wish that what we could do within all of our curriculums would be to, um, even if it's through videos and showing things in classes, show the different styles and the different approaches to improvisation versus choosing a school of thought and then just kind of uh, saying that this is how you improvise. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I, I would add that in the United States, I think, I sense that uh, the majority of improvisers in the United States look at improv as a stepping stone. Um, and I think globally, when you say the United States, you know, the word Hollywood comes to mind. Like we are kind of the Hollywood country, even New York is Hollywood. <laughs> so that um, improvisation is a means to some type of commercial end um i for a long time i always thought improv was united states and impro was canada um 
and I, I went to Canada early, you know, in my life. And as festivals first started happening uh, back in the day, um, to me, it, I was only I was first aware of the United States and Canada and then through the Chicago Improv Festival and bringing more groups in, we saw that there was um, other stuff. But I, I would agree with Elise, like we're we are sort of you know, we are the center of commercial narcissism in the world. And so um, I think it would follow that uh, that many people are unaware of how the United States is viewed outside of the United States. Great, thank you. Uh, can I ask the next, next question, Jim? Go for it. Uh, so this question uh, is, uh, I'm gonna ask Sergio. Uh, and then there'll be a follow-up question for the panel. Uh, so Danielle, if you don't mind translating. Uh, often improvisation is divided into two categories and you hear people refer to it as either comedic or dramatic. Um, but Sergio, you're doing a show called, and I've, I've just put it in chat to Danielle so he can correct me. Cuando menos es más? Cuando menos es más. Yeah. Yes. And I was reading uh, an interview uh, in which you referred to it as impromptu dramatic comedy. So blending the drama and the comedy into one and not segregating them. So what is impromptu dramatic comedy? What does that mean? Eh, Sergio, Patti eh, tiene una pregunta especial para ti porque ya dice que hay la improvisación generalmente se divide en, en comedia o en, o en drama. Y ella estuvo un poco viendo eh, acerca de tu espectáculo Cuando Menos Es Más y vio una entrevista donde tú hablas que es un espectáculo de tragicomedia. ¿Y cómo ves tú esto de tragicomedia en la impro? Sí, un poco eh, el, el tipo de improvisación que yo busco hacer o, o investigar, yo lo, lo describo a veces como esta improvisación realista, cotidiana. Y, y dentro de esta estructura, eh, la definición que a veces más se acerca es la, la comedia dramática. Y, y yo lo llevo un poquito a la vida, porque para mí la vida, eh, o, o el realismo cotidiano que nos sucede a nosotros, tiene que ver con, con, unas, con situaciones que pasan por la comedia o el drama. Eh, digamos que, 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 que si uno tratara de representar lo, lo realista, cotidiano, no no está tan delimitado en la comedia del drama, están juntas. Y a veces en una misma situación puede aparecer la comedia e inmediatamente el drama. Y por ahí es la línea de, de investigación o de búsqueda o de, de, de juego que yo me planteo con la impro. ¿no? Es tratar de hacer una improvisación que se acerque a, a lo cotidiano, ¿no? a, a la realidad de las personas. Uh, so Sergio is saying that the kind of improvisation that he's interested in or that he's been uh, researching has a lot to do with everyday life and uh, the realistic uh, interpretation of everyday life where uh, situations could be uh, comedic or dramatic and sometimes he has seen that some situations could be both. At the same time, a comedy, and at the same time, a tragedy. Uh, and so he's very interested in, this, in these situations and looking the game within that, in, in the search of this realism, this reality, in, and bringing that to, to stage. Mm. A comedy and at the same time a tragedy is officially going to be the name of my autobiography. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I 
Love that answer. Uh, and I agree very much with Sergio. I feel that <clears throat> our work isn't one or the other. The work is the story that arrives and allows for both. But the improv community keeps wanting to divide things, short form, long form, comedy, drama. Uh, so throwing it open to the panel, what do you think in particular about this wanting to divide comedy and drama as two separate forms of improvisation? Is it useful? Any thoughts? I mean, I would start with it's subjective. Mm. And so people are free to divide it if they want. And um, so on one hand, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of ways to look at it. And um, I, I look at improvisation as I've come to, a, I've arrived at this idea that improvisation, it is a, it's a process of engagement. It's a process of engaging and um, improvising happens outside of the theater, a theatrical context all the time, but there are schools uh, and pursuits that then ascribe approaches that make it theater. And I think maybe a better or maybe a more accurate or helpful divider is improvisation that's working from the outside in or improvisation that's working from the inside out. So I think there's improvisation that starts with structure and tries to feel the soul in the structure. And I think there's improvisation that starts with soul and then tries to discover the structure. And then I think that there's a mix of both. And so that's what I'm jamming on <laughs> at this point. Is he... Sorry. No, Is he wanna... For me, it's very interesting because it's kind of trying to name... It's like life in a way. Improvisation has its own uh, speed and his own, own vibe. And it's trying to to name it or to in a way try to control it. I would be very nervous if I was on a show that has to be dramatic, <laughs> 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 or in a show that just has to be comedy, because I think improvisation is what it it wants to be. We are just there to channel it out, but in a way. Sometimes you're in a scene and it's calling for almost like you have no control of what's coming out in a way. So for me, it may be a way of people uh, to name or almost uh, sell a show so people know more or less what to expect. But when I am playing, I think I... I never think if I'm going to be uh, playing a drama or a comedy. Usually commonly arrives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think what what I what I was going to share, um I'm glad that you went first Daniel because for me it's the expectation I, I don't like the feeling of, okay, if we're going to do a short form show, fine. But I don't like, for example, if I'm in a rehearsal and I am naturally drawn to do something a little more dramatic or something that I'm not pushing to be funny. And then the room is like, oh, you're, is this wrong? Like, are you doing it wrong? Like, I don't like those expectations. Um, because yes, like Daniel says, like it naturally, I think the comedy naturally always arrives. And I think that sometimes the expectation is that it has to be hysterical the whole way through and it doesn't allow much room for any variations of comedy or variations of truth. So I think for me, that's what I'm always kind of struggling with. And also tying back to something that Joe said earlier, how in the United States, we are typically using improv as a means to a different end improv for me like when i as an improviser i never say that i am i am in love entirely with improvisation as a performance art i am in in love with improv because of how it makes me creative 
and then that makes me creative in other places so whenever i have restrictions in the improv space to be funny or to be dramatic and not let it evolve organically then i i don't feel that i'm getting the benefit that i seek in improv which is to expand my brain and let my brain do what it wants to do and lead me where it's supposed to go a me a me particularmente lo que más me preocupa más que que sea comedia o que sea drama es que, que esté la verdad que haya en, en las dos partes, ¿no? Cómo, cómo lograr eh, encontrar la verdad tanto en la comedia como en el drama. Me parece que, que es distinto y, y creo que nuestra preocupación no tiene que ser tanto que cuál es el género, porque eso del género creo que depende del estilo que cada uno quiera trabajar, pero todos deberíamos apuntar a descubrir la verdad del género que estemos trabajando, del estilo que estemos trabajando. Eh, Sergio says, for me, uh, I'm interested in the truth, independently of it being a comedy or a tragedy. I think we as improvisers should uh, dig into searching for this truth, no matter what genre or what style we are playing. Yeah, that's funny. That's like right on my thing. It's just like, I think I'm a point in my career because I've been doing it for 30 years now, uh, especially in Toronto. I, you know, no one's going to bring me onto their show to do like, ha ha, <coughs> jokey improv. Like I'm all about story. I'm all about truth. I'm, I'm all about like bringing, like people can be chaotic around me. And my goal is like, what's the, let me ground this. What's the story? Let's take it through. But again, like that's for me, that's what I enjoy about improvisation. I, because I'm not a stand up and I'm not a joke creator, but I am someone who loves to find the comedy in the tears and the vice versa. And for, And I think again, right? It, like, like it has been pointed out. I think it all depends on what what's your jam. Like, what's your what's your gig? Like, do you want to just go out and Keith used to say, um, call it popcorn, right? Like popcorn scenes where people liked it, it was really good, but then they leave the theater and they're hungry. And they're hungry again. So that idea of giving some popcorn scenes, but also making sure that you have some scenes that have a bit of weight and a bit of fullness, so that people feel like they've also had a meal along with the popcorn. So I think I've kind of carried that with me throughout it. So I think it's everything. I think if you start ripping it apart, then you're too much in your head. And the last thing you want to be when you're improvising is in your head. And if you're thinking this is a comedy, this is a drama, a drama, a drama, then, then you're already in your head and it's too late. You're ruined. <laughs> and I think I would add a bumper sticker onto what you asked, Patty, but I think some people improvise for comedy as the goal. And I think others improvise where comedy is the consequence. And so it seems like a lot of us here are saying our, our personal preference is to improvise where comedy is the consequence of pursuing each other and what's the truth of the moment. Some, sometimes just adding to this thing that Joel is saying, I find myself feeling that I am playing a comedy but the audience is is seeing a tragedy or vice versa sometimes i feel that this is tragic what i'm doing and people are laughing and maybe sometime after the show they realize what they were laughing about and then they see the tragedy in that comedy so it's also comedy could be tragic and tra and tragedy could be funny <laughs> in a way and it's also i think it changes with time well, the time when you're watching it but also when you reflect on on what you saw it could be strange <laughs> it could be the di a different genre already I'd just like to add in with jumping with my own thoughts there is that something that I've been thinking about over the last few months is that I'm an improviser who is non-binary 
and I've been thinking over the last few months over like what a non-binary improvisation looks like. And for me, the distinction of like drama or comedy is one of those things where I'm interested in creating art that isn't exclusively either of them, but contains elements of both to push something new. And I think what's also interesting is like the type of improvisation that I like doing is that people who do theatre, like people who are trained actors, like have said to me, oh, you do the comedy, right? I go, well, no, it's got elements of theatre as well. But then comedians I know say like, oh, you do like the theatre sort of thing. Okay, it's not really that funny. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in something that takes elements of both and creates something new or tries to do both at once, um, like we've talked about. Uh, Patty, would you like to ask the next question? I absolutely can. Uh, so. Um... I actually, if I can say something about what Jim just said. Please. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about what you just said and how interesting it is that uh, improv is meant to be this thing that is created as it goes, but we as humans will do anything possible to categorize and classify so that we can get it right. Um, so that, thank you, Jim, that just made me think a little bit more on that. And also not that I need permission, but it also, it reminds, it reminds me that that is what typically is happen happening, that people are just trying to put it into a box so that we can do it correctly and be in a box and belong and fuck a box. That's it. <laughs> That's the, the merch we'll be selling after this panel. <laughs> T-shirts that say fuck a box. Yes. And it is part of the merch for my book called Comedy, but also a tragedy. <laughs> my autobiography. Um, I wanted a uh, couple of questions specific to sort of to rules, uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, go to audience questions. Uh, so one of pop over to Christy and ask a question. Um, so there is a, a famous impro rule, don't ask questions. Mm. Uh, but you do a show called Blind Date, which basically you're on stage for over 90 minutes improvising with an audience member as a clown going on a date with an audience member. And I was reading a beautiful interview that you did with CBC where you said, uh, they were asking about how you work with a volunteer. And you said, to be others focused, a great improv skill, to ask probing, open-ended questions. Really, it's just about being curious. So how does that beautiful statement fit in with the rule, don't ask questions? <laughs> it's, uh, the, I, yeah, I think the, I, when I think about why was the rule of don't ask questions created, I think it is, it must have been because if you ask questions in a scene, you are putting all the pressure on your scene partner. What is this? Where are we going? Oh, I opened this box. Ooh, look at it. Oh, I've written a poem. You read it. Like all these things where you take everything off you and put it on your partner. So I, I can only assume that's why that rule was created. But for me, like we've been talking and I've mentioned before that my improv is truth-based. Like that's where life is. That's where the comedy is. That's where the dram drama is. And so you cannot, in my mind, have a scene that's grounded in any truth or for me interest if you're not asking questions of the person that you're on stage with because those are inevitably going to come up, especially when you're exploring who are we to each other? Because if you look at any relationship you have in life, you are always asking each other questions. And I'm hopefully, like this panel tonight, I would love to have two hours one-on-one -on -one with each one of these people just to ask questions because the humans are fascinating. And that's what Blind Date is. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a comedy show, but, um, but it's really an interview show. It really is bringing up a civilian um, who's terrified to be on stage, making them comfortable and finding out who this, you know, accountant is because he, he is fascinating. Um, I obviously do that heteronormative blind date. So it's always men, which is why I say he, um, but uh, I, for me, 
on stage, whether with a civilian or with other improvisers, if they're, if I have someone come on stage with me, I want to know who you are. And so questions are part of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> uh, and just want to say, because you mentioned that you do the heteronormative version of blind date, there is also queer blind date as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So my truth is, as a heteronormative woman, I, I do the heteronormative blind date, but then we also have, yeah, um, a clown who is gay and, and, a, and a female clown who is lesbian. And yeah, so we get to explore those worlds. And we have also uh, a, um, a couple clowns that are also bisexual. And so all that idea of exploring and my gosh, like to move forward and have a non-binary clown. Like, I just think that that whole world of all of those norms, like to just a, toss them aside and it's just about being on stage in your truth I think is really beautiful wonderful thank you so we move to I another think, question oh mm -hmm. go ahead Sorry. I, I I think there's a very interesting thing you're saying there that is that is also related to this rule of not saying no <laughs> in, because in life, we say no all the time, and we ask questions all the time, as you were saying, as, as Christy was saying. And, and when you see scenes that are built like that, they seem so far from life. Like, if I come with a gun and I'm going to shoot you, shoot you, and I'm, I say, I'm going to shoot you, the natural response will be to say, no, <laughs> don't do it or why hmm. but if you go okay should be then it's it's funny in a way it's silly but it's so far from from what real life is in a way so i really like this idea that christy was talking about of of questions and and no being part of life hmm very important part of life especially if we're looking for conflict and things like that can i add yeah. a tiny please i like the idea that for one of these rules it's usually fine if a character breaks the rules and then it's usually a red flag if an improviser does because it means they're not in character <laughs> so if if I have to deal with that rule, then I back out of the rule and I then say, what does it mean for you to be in character? Mm. Uh, because characters can do anything. But if an improviser is being blocked from stepping into a character by their own fear or barriers or whatever, then that's really the issue. So mm. my, my guess is that these rules were invented before psychoanalysis became popular. <laughs> Following up on that, because uh, I was asking you about the foundation of Annoyance Theater, because you're one of the co-founders, uh, and you had said that um, Mick is kind of the first artistic director of Annoyance, kind of created the first artistic vision statement, if you will, of Annoyance, yeah. Yeah. and that uh, vision statement was, fuck the rules, let's do impro shows, plays, musicals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was fuck the rules, for sure. That was sort of our the bell we rang as we arrived in Chicago. <laughs> but the, the I, th I think the revelation was the best way to take care of your scene partner is to take care of yourself first. So mm -hmm. that was the one that caused the shockwave. So that was the proactive rule that went on the flip side of the fuck the rules coin. And then, of course, those of us that were, you know, founders, we all have 20 different ideas about even what that means, because that's what age does to you. Right. And it's interesting, these these different concepts of the rules. Um, Elise, you have a workshop um, where um, I think it's you can't fuck up my scene. You can't fuck up my scene. Yeah. And uh, what I found very interesting in reading the description of it was uh, it says something along the lines of, we all know that moment where someone comes in and denies your reality or breaks the impro rules. Mm -hmm. And what fascinated me was the statement, we all know the moment. Mm -hmm. So we're accepting that it's a common behavior that people will come in and deny your reality. 
or people will come in and kind of fuck up your scene. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to me that you have a workshop that's basically helping people defend themselves because this behavior has become common. So what's the point of having rules if people are going to break them and it's going to cause stress and then people have to find ways of defending to themselves? To fix it, yeah. yeah well, so what are your thoughts? What's happening with with that? Like, So in that workshop particularly, um, the the title means a couple of things it means you can't fuck up my scene in the way that you've just described it but it's also a way of saying no really you can't fuck up my scene so just come play like nothing that you say can fuck me up right um so it kind of works in both ways and um and I think it is interesting like the two the two workshops that I that I do regularly that I'll that's kind of like that I offer both have to do with just finding confidence in your own skill and ability, because I think that what happens is that when we put so many rules on everything, um, then there's not really much room to play in a different way. And so everybody has to find their own confidence. Like it's, you can't fuck up my scene is all about nothing that anyone can do can fuck up your scene. And there's no such thing as my scene, by the way, you can't, you can't fuck up my scene. That's like, there's just so many plays on that. But then the other one is all about uh, improv identity and like just understanding that you have your own skill set that's unique to you. And that is, again, just a way of saying like, if, if you don't improvise by the way that the rules are or the schools tell you you should do then that's fine. That's the way that you improvise is its own pedagogy is its own approach. It's its own method. So, um, yeah, you you saying that now makes me realize that everything that I teach is legitimately just to be like, who cares? Just do whatever you do and feel good about what you do. So, yeah, I mean, in a way it is about like, what's the point of the rules if everybody's going to fuck them up anyway? But it's also <laughs> a matter of like, I don't know why people take such possession over these rules instead of it's kind of like the Bible. Oh, fuck, I'm going to get canceled fast. It's kind of like the Bible where it's like people will come in and be like, these are the words and this is what the words mean, right? Versus like, no, this is just like be nice to people. <laughs> like it's just guidance for you to take on and be individualize and actualize on your own. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I'm yeah. a verbal, verbal processor. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Jim, do we have two, time for two questions? Quick questions before we hand over to the audience. I think so, yeah. Yeah, so maybe we can just remind the audience to start putting their questions in and Jim's gonna start looking at them. Uh, so a question for Daniel and a question for Sergio and then we go to the audience. Uh, Danielle, you uh, do a show called Speechless uh, with uh, Felipe Ortez and uh, Sarah Michelson, DJ Mama Cutsworth, um, which is uh, a wordless show driven by a musical soundscape. I believe that's how it's described on the website, which I love. But there's no words. You don't speak in the show. So you can't say yes and, which is the dictation of the rule. You can't name each other verbally. You can't verbally identify the who, what, where. You can't verbally be specific and label and identify everything. And yet you manage to do this beautiful one hour show and you're breaking all of these impro rules. Daniel, how do you do it? <laughs> well, I think there's two answers to that question. One would be, we do all of those things. We just don't do it with words. I think there's a lot of, of fine tuning with your partner, in this case with Felipe, where I, I feel what he's doing. I, I sometimes could anticipate what he's gonna do. And I feel that he could do the same with me. And the same thing with Sarah is like, so in a way, I think these rules they talk about that yes and naming in some part of our journey, or at least in my journey, I, I saw them as rules, as rules that were kind of trying to teach me things. 
more than rules, they were kind of guides. And it's a little bit like when you're practicing a sport, like when you're learning how to play basketball, you shoot some hoops from different areas in the court. But when you're in the court, you just get the ball and shoot. There's no time for, for thinking, oh, what I have to do is stand like this. And maybe if I do this, the ball will uh, move in a certain way that is better or easier for the, when you're there, you are not thinking. So in this, in this show in particular, there's, there has to be this focus on what is happening and forgetting everything else and just letting that thing happen is more sometimes I think when it doesn't work or when it's difficult, I think it's more that I am stepping on the way. Mm -hmm. I am stopping that thing from happening because of ego or because you're worried or because you really want the show to be great or because you had a bad day or something like that. But in a way, all of these things are happening. Sometimes you could also ar argue that saying no is the, is the biggest yes. <laughs> <laughs> in a way, because it's what the other uh, improviser needs or wants you to say. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, all of these rules are also going against themselves because they have a double meaning. It's mm -hmm. very yin and yang sort of thing for me. Like they have both sides, the negative, where they will block you from. But if you also think about them, like, like in this example, you find that they, they are also full of wisdom in a way. Mm -hmm. But I think what we, what I try to do as an improviser is to, to tune myself to this wisdom that is behind everything uh, that is improvisation in, the, in its essence. And, it, and it, it doesn't really care about names or about genres or about uh, if you're a man or a woman or it doesn't care about those things. It's bigger than all of those things. So in Speechless, I think for me, it's a big celebration of, of embracing this force that is, that is bigger than us. It's like life in a way. Uh, that is also the thing that keeps me coming back to improvisation because you also fight with it. It's, it's not only, yeah, super fun. And you also have moments where you struggle and you have a difficult time, but it, it always calls me back, mm -hmm. even when I fight with it. With it so <laughs> <laughs> I think I it's think funny. Like, we're so used to like, yes, and, but there's also no and. I think it's just the problem is no and complete blocking, but you can no and someone no and here's why like i think that's equally an important rule i think like you were saying right like you can say no as long as it's just not no and then putting it back on that person right it's just like no and i'm also giving you this offer because of this and then that helps to keep it truthful and living also, does your musical, is it musically, imp like, is there a musical improviser so that the mu they are playing with you? Is it this? <gasps> yeah, DJ Mama Cutsworth. She's in uh, Winnipeg. You need to meet her, Christy. She's phenomenal. I need to talk about this later after. She's fantastic, yeah. She's amazing. I she miss her so much. <laughs> and amazing. Uh, the questions coming in from the audience are fantastic and amazing. So Ooh. if you're able to uh, put your questions in the Q&A box, we will start getting to them. I'm going to start with a question from Kitty Parker, which is, if you could give a beginner improviser one piece of advice, what would you tell them? Is it something that's helped you develop 
something that you've learned through your wisdom that you'd like to pass on? What's a, what's a piece of advice you would give a beginner improviser? Hmm. Hmm. I think it would be wise to look at who the improviser is and know that there's not just one note you would give to every be improviser. So if we're, I think all of us are teachers. So, and I know, mo I, th I know almost everybody here, I've not met Sergio before, but when you're looking at a student and if they say, even in the way they ask, what's one piece of advice you would give me? That might give me a clue about the piece of advice I might give that person. And then it, if I have a default, it's um, don't improvise um, so that you can compare yourself to other people. I thought you were just going to stop at don't improvise, which like from a career I, point of view. I mean, that's sense. the funny move, Jim. <laughs> of course. Don't that's improvise. only if we were doing specifically comedic improv here. Mm, mm. And then ding, think, new choice. I think that for me, I I agree with Joe, it's, it's a little bit difficult to advise somebody that you don't really know, but I can talk about two moments that I have reflected a lot uh, during the pandemic about teachings that improvisation has given me. And I think there were two moments that were very rich. One was moments where I saw people that I admired or people that I considered gurus failing. <laughs> having a really bad show and, and, and really being lost and being blocked and all of these things that improvises fear. I think for me, it was a big teaching scene, seeing these friends and also people that I simply admire but I'm not friends with fail. And the same thing the other way around. I was one day in uh, Montreal with a friend, staying at a friend's house that is not an improviser, but he went uh, with me to, to like see if we could play, if I, if I could play in a maestro in this theater that people didn't know me and they believed we were both improvisers. And I just said, just, just play, play along, play along. And then he won the maestro just by being really truthful. He still makes fun of me, like, when do you want a workshop? When That's do you amazing. Want a but for me, it's also big teaching because it's like improvisation doesn't care about if you're a beginner or an expert or, or if you have 50 years of experience or one day. It's, it's bigger than that in a sense. So my, my advice, I think, if it could be a thing that could get to anybody, it would be just, just trust that that improvisation is there for you, that is calling you. If you are excited about doing it, it's because improvisation is choosing you to do it in a way. Me. A mí me pasa que, que siento que, que hay un concepto como si la improvisación tuviera que ver con, con la habilidad de tener ideas o de, o de ser creativo o, o, o de ser genial, ¿no? Y, y yo entiendo más la improvisación como la capacidad de contar historias con otro. Entonces, por ahí a veces cuando me pongo a pensar qué, qué le podría decir a alguien que empieza, le diría, eh, sé tú, eh, escúchate y, y apuntaría a eso, ¿no? a, a, a esta capacidad que tenemos de empezar a escuchar y a ver lo que pueden dar los otros y que nos ayuden a nosotros a contar historias. Eh, quitarle el estrés de la, de, de la habilidad de la improvisación y, y, y quedarnos mucho más con, con esta cuestión que tiene que ver con, con, con lo que nos da la improvisación, que tiene que ver con, 
reaccionar a lo que el otro nos propone. Yo lo planteo que la, la impro no, no, no nos debería estresar, ¿no? nos debería dar siempre un espacio de, de placer y de juego. Y, y para mí la línea de trabajo de, nunca debería alejarse de esa consigna. Sergio dice que ha estado notando que la improvisación es a veces ligada a tu habilidad de ser creativa y de tener ideas or thinking about outside the box in a way uh, and he will he's more focused in the the capacity to tell stories or to build stories with others so he will set he will say to new improvise new improvisers be yourself mm -hmm. just listen to yourself and see what could other gives to give to you and what could you give to others and in a way release improvisation from this stress of being good of being creative because he believes that improvisation should not be stressful it should be a game it's something that we go in and play with pleasure i want to i would like to say something about that because uh i hear that entirely However, I think that improv has a way of bringing out all of the things that we need to psychologically work on. <laughs> so um, just because it is a very vulnerable sport for the lack of a better term. And I think that even though, yes, improvisation is not supposed to be difficult or stressful, I think that part of it is kind of working things, helping us work things out. So part of it, maybe is supposed to be a little stressful like maybe we do need to learn to give space and take to to give focus to others sometimes maybe it is going to be a little uncomfortable because it is also such a social for lack of a better term sport so um it's almost like a, you go through a maturation process when you go through improv and that's that can be stressful but it is also kind of like you know like part of life is sadness and part of life is challenge it's I, that's that's what i would say about that i agree that it should not be stressful but at the same time i i i think there's a duality in that where it it's kind of supposed to teach you things mm. um yeah quieres decir yeah, un pequeño resumen de eso para que sergio siga la idea Oh, ¿qué quieres decirlo, decirlo a él? Sí, lo que acabas de decir, pero sí. para que Sergio sepa qué es. Sí, díselo tú, porque imagínate. Bueno, Elis dice que... Porque que... yo nomás que sé hablar español en cubano, y no sé hablar español. <risa> que la improvisación también nos trae cosas que necesitamos aprender que necesitamos enfrentar y cosas de nuestra forma de ser. Y entonces muchas veces es, hay que enfrentar ese, ese estrés o, ese, o esa cosa difícil que nos pone la improvisación, porque en el fondo hay una enseñanza. Y muchas veces la improvisación es la única cosa que nos puede dar esa, que nos puede dar esa lección. Right? I'm saying that some, many times improv is the only thing that can give us that lesson. Right, mm -hmm. because where else are we? Are, you're not. What are you going to do? At, do that at the office? You're going to do it at the office, and <laughs> where you work with copy machines? No, right. <laughs> so yeah, muchas veces yo creo que la improvisación es el único sitio donde de verdad podemos aprender eso. There's something that Sergio reminds me of. Uh, something I learned from a therapist that I translate to an improv note, and it is. Uh, Beginning improvisers tend to concern themselves with what they can get. And intermediate improvisers tend to concern themselves with what they can prove. Mm. But advanced improvisers concern themselves with what they can give. Mm. And because getting and proving are both fear-based, when Sergio is saying we need to play from this space of relaxation, to your point, Elise, like it's traumatic if you're used to walking through life 
an approving state or in a getting state, it will be traumatic to release that sense of control to get into the giving state that Impro requires. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Blew <laughs> my mind, Joe Bill. You just blew my mind. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> therapy. Amazing. Yay therapy. Yay therapy. I'm always like, and when I teach, I'm all like, if you want to get on stage and be funny, go be a stand-up. If you want to get on stage and be a collective, stay in my class. But that's much more beautiful what you said. <laughs> I paid a lot of money to that shrink for that quote. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it, <laughs> worth it. I'm gonna steal it. Um, I have a, a follow-up question uh, for Christy. Um, so here they talked about the uh, improvisation as a form of maturation. Uh, in, in your bio that I read out, it said that you started improvising when you were 16. I started when I was 15, playing in bars that I was not legally supposed to be in. Um, how, how, if you reflect on like, your growth from sort of like 16 to roughly being an adult, like how do you see Impro like interacting with that? Do you feel like you grew up differently because you were improvising than your friends who weren't? Yeah, I think I have a much more, and I think we all do, all of us on this panel, a, a more youthful spirit because our careers are based in play, which I think is really important. I do a lot of workshops uh, with corporations um, using improv for communication and leadership and all that. And you just see lights click on in the workshop. And I mean, I think it's interesting as, uh, you know, I was 16 in the, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. And for women that, you know, and still for women in the comedy world, not that I want to diverge this talk into that, but it, there was a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff. Diverge, like, diverge, go there. <laughs> sisters, <laughs> preach. Um, there's a lot. It, it, there's a lot. And Patty, too, like, knows, and I'm sure at least knows, like, there, there's a lot of stuff that I um experienced that was very difficult um and it's i don't know and it's interesting being a female in comedy um and i think that when you are thrown into this very more male energy dominated field i think as a woman it's it's very interesting what you learn from there that you take out into the world because i definitely this may sound super weird, but I've definitely found myself in situations in the real world where I was using improv to basically save my ass. Um, and, and I actually, even two weeks ago, I was walking home um, from doing a show and uh, met someone in the alley. And I was like, improv skills, improv skills. And so I don't know, I don't, that's definitely not what your question was about. Um, but I think that I, there is that thing about knowing that you can improvise, knowing that you can create, knowing that you can shift and, and be where you need to be and figure out what that person wants and what that person needs and what you need and where you want to go is extremely transferable from on stage to real life experiences. That's way too probably dark and deep than the question. And I apologize. Fuck it. it. Fuck <laughs> it. <laughs> Fuck the box. <laughs> but yeah. it's in, it's interesting right as you know right uh, we talked it's kind of full circle back to the beginning of in the box right yeah like male female non-binary fluid comedy drama like it's all so exhausting where it's just like let's get on stage let's look at each other in the eyes let's breathe together fuck it let's get a suggestion from those yahoos in the audience and let's just create together. Like that's what improv is. Mm. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I think you do know. <laughs> I do know. <laughs> I think you, I know I it think, is for me. I know for it is for sure. me. And I would never for push sure. that on other people, but for me, that's what it is. Mm. With the uh, the question about teaching a beginner, I just want to do a follow up question uh, with Sergio, because um, in. Uh, the interview that I read about this new show he was doing, he said, uh, where is it? There are those who will be good actors and others bad. I don't think art can be taught. 
one can have a vocation. One can become technical with these concepts, but the impro is one of the most complete trainings. So can you teach impro to everyone and anyone? Or are there some people who can't or won't improvise? Sergio, eh, Patty te pregunta, basa, basándose un poco en la entrevista que diste acerca de cuando menos es más, si tú consideras que la improvisación es algo que se puede enseñarle a cualquiera, cualquiera tiene la habilidad de ser un improvisador y de aprender esto, o que es una cosa eh, para la cual tú naces o, o tienes ese, ese talento, por llamarlo así, de esa forma. A ver, yo, yo creo que todos somos improvisadores todos los seres humanos. Nuestra vida está basada en la improvisación. Eh, también creo que no enseñamos a improvisar. Creo que, que generamos espacios o, o, o estructuras donde la gente pueda desarrollar esta técnica. Y creo que hay gente que tiene talento y que va a ser un buen improvisador, un buen actor, eh, pero no va a depender de un buen maestro. Nosotros, como maestros, podemos llegar a enseñar ética y técnica. Eh, el resto lo traen las personas. Eh, los buenos improvisadores eh, ya vienen. Los buenos actores eh, ya nacen. Yo no, no creo que uno enseñe. Pero sí podemos ayudarlos a hacerlo, pero sí creo que todo el mundo, todo el mundo puede usar la improvisación para desarrollarse como, como personas o como, eh, como el juego, ¿no? Porque, porque la, la actuación o la improvisación para mí está ligado al juego. Y, y, y un adulto eh, puede recuperar esa capacidad de juego que tenía de niño y, y la improvisación es un camino para eso. Okay, so Sergio start, starts answering to that question by saying that he believes that uh, we all are good improvisers as humans because what we do in life is improvise. Uh, so we are all wired to do that. On the other hand, he also believes uh, we as teachers do not teach how to improvise. We create structures so that people could find improvisation, but there's no such a thing as teaching improvisation in a way. Mm -hmm. And there's also this group of people that are talented, that were in a way born with a, a with an improvisation vein uh, that don't even need a teacher. They, they are flowing in, in, the, in that state. As teachers, we can uh, bring things of ethics and techniques, but we cannot really shape anybody into being an improviser. On the other hand, he sees that improvisation is an excellent tool uh, for people to become a better person and for adults to reconnect with that sense of play and this, uh, their own childhood uh, powers, you know. So yes, he, that's his answer. Muy, muy bien traducido. Ah, very good. That was very good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in on that one. <laughs> He's also saying that he wants, he wants to uh, send me a cake because I am fabulous. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's very kind of you, sir. Yeah. Um, we've got, I think, time for about two more questions. Um, there's a question here from Rita Fernandez Palacios for Joe. Um, can you tell when someone's ego is blocking a scene and what do you suggest? 
And I'm going to split this into two questions here because I think there's they're both interpretations and I'm interested in the answer to both. Can you tell when someone else's ego is blocking a scene? How do you diagnose that? And also, how can you tell when your own ego is blocking a scene and get out of your own way? So I think it's related. I'll relate it to the last thing that we were just talking about, which is from my point of view, I agree with Sergio. Uh, we can't teach anybody to improvise, but we can help them. We can teach them to get the things that are in their way out of their way so that improvisation is there. And so me, because I'm a neuroscience nerd, yes, I can tell <laughs> 99 out of 100 times when somebody's ego is uh, blocking them versus when somebody's fear or anxiety is blocking them. And then half of teaching people to get out of their own way is tricking them. And half of that, half of it is telling them to get out of their own way. And so the second part of the question is much more difficult. For me, I think aging was mostly, and it goes back to what we were talking about, about giving. We Improvisation is a service proposition. We are in service, period. And so we all serve in different ways. Also love the idea that um, listening is the willingness to change. And I like that because that's an individual responsibility because every individual has a different relationship to their own willingness to change. So I was, I had a great teacher, Martin DeMott at Second City that introduced me immediately to my ego in level two, class one. And he cured me of being a fraternity boy. I'm eternally grateful. Um, but on the other side of that ego was all of this fear and anxiety that I was blocking. Um, and so to me, the to show people, and to Daniel's point, it's important that we are willing to put ourselves in any improvisational situation, even if it's not the type of improv that we like to do. Um, or for me as a teacher, I want to be able to go anywhere in the world in any language and see if I can be of service to whoever I'm on stage with. I don't know that I can, but if, if that's not, if I'm not willing to do that, then I have to stop. So that's just my personal answer. I'd love to hear what other people think. I, I think... In the second question, or the second part of that question, when you're you're asking if you can spot yourself or your ego from stopping you to flow in improvisation, I think we can, but in a way it's the same ego that is in a way stopping you for, uh, from accepting that that happened. You're in this fight with your ego because you know you did these things. You know that because of ego, you were <laughs> making these things happen. But you also know that your ego doesn't want you to point it out. And I, in a way, I, it comes back to what Elise was saying. I think improvisation faces you with those things. Uh, so that you face your ego, face your fears, or this anxiety that, that Joe was, was saying. You could choose to run away and hide, but, but improvisation will eventually call you again, and it will eventually face you again with those fears and those things until, in a way, you give up to, to it. And then the thing moves forward, you know. At least in my case. <laughs> um, I love this. I, I've been thinking about, I'm so glad that this conversation went this way because I was thinking about the ego earlier when we were talking about um, when Joe said, and then dropped the mic uh, about the beginner, intermediate, advanced. Um, 
I think it also still, I know, then everybody's brain explode, exploded. Um, I think it goes back to that, what I was saying with the, what improv does. And I think in beginner and intermediate, what we're doing is we're grappling with the ego. And then at that point, we just have to accept that our ego is always going to be there. And then we just learn to have a conversation with it on a regular basis. <laughs> like that time that I asked Patty, what to do when I plateau and she told me that's my ego and then I wrote down in my notebook it turn off ego <laughs> and you know it's just like oh, okay so now it's just like you just have an ongoing conversation with the ego and like Daniel I feel like Daniel was just saying exactly what it is like we discover the ego and then because of our ego we decide we don't want to have an ego anymore <laughs> like it's like it's it's just an ongoing relationship and conversation which makes us, I think, as improvisers, yes, I will say it, better humans if we if we if we if we allow it to, because we we can at that point then go into service because we are aware of ourselves, not because we have to, but because we we have the capacity then to be able to. Um not that I'm fully there, but yeah. I'll say this, doing 10 years of blind date where you're asking a non-improviser to come up stage and they're entrusting you. I've never seen so much fear in people's eyes than when I sit across that table. The first they come and I bring them down and they sit down and we're across the table from each other. And I look them, I just look at them in the eye. And what I do for my journey in the show is I just take a breath with them to really gauge where they're at. And for me, that was such a lesson as an improviser because you're spinning a lot of plates, but the biggest plate you're spinning is taking care of this audience member. And so you can have ego. I've got to control the show. I've got to keep it going. I've got to make sure that it's entertaining and it's got to move forward. And I've got the plot points that maybe we've got to hit. There maybe there's a partner in the audience. I've got to spin that plate. But the main one is you have to release everything about you and you've got to put it all on them. How do I make them look good? How do I make them feel safe? How do I make them feel comfortable? And it's really fascinating coming off, you know, a two month run or whatever of doing that show and then actually going to do an improv show with improvisers with that mindset of, of like, I'm gonna make you, how do I make you feel comfortable? How do I make you look good? How do we play together? Where can we connect? Like, it's such a great, um, it was such a, such a great lesson in that idea because you can't bring ego into that show because it's not about you. It's, it's blind, you know, whatever it's about, it's blind day, whatever, but it's about the audience member. It's about them. It's about making them the hero. Not mm -hmm. you. You're just the idiot with a clown nose on and a tight dress. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, but it's really about who are they? And that is what the beauty of the show is. And that's the beauty of improv. Who are the people on stage with you? I think. Mm -hmm. And I just I, want to jump in because everything that you just said, I feel like I totally resonate with. And then at the same time, as a, as a woman and a person of color, that conversation of an, of, only focusing on taking care of somebody else gets very tenuous. So then I feel like I definitely grapple with, like if I were doing that show, right? Of course I have status and power because I am the experienced improviser there. But if I'm doing it in front of a cishet white guy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be safe. Like my level of establishing safety for that person for whom I have some sort of power and authority but I'm still a marginalized person and compared to this person, like that is something that uh, I feel like for me in entering service is always a conversation in my brain. Mm -hmm. Like, how am I going to make sure that I am providing the kindness and the service that I should provide as an improviser? And at the same time, maybe fuck you. I don't know. I don't know. Yet. Yes. A hundred percent and yeah. trust in 10 years. I've had many moments on stage <laughs> where I have been so disrespected and I have done shows where I'm just like, this show's done. This show mm -hmm. is done. Right. Yeah. Like you've got, there is, and thank you for bringing that up because I don't want to, I don't want to put out there that you are sacrificing your morals, your self-respect, who you are, uh, you know what I mean? Like all that stuff, you've got to keep all that. Um, and there is 
there definitely is a boundary to that. And yeah, I've hit, I had that wall try to get hit in and you're just, and I, yeah, you're just like, okay, let's just go over here for a second and have a little conversation. Like, yeah. uh, no. Yeah. And yeah, underneath sure. this, when we're talking about two improvisers working, there's the assumption that both improvisers are coming in to service each for each other. And mm -hmm. both improvisers are coming in, in that shared space. If one improviser isn't, then it creates that imbalance. It, it breaks yeah. the creative aim, the objective. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there's scripts in society that are already in, in imbalance. So this individual may think they're coming in, playing in service, but because of their privilege, because of how they've been raised in society, because of how they view the world, they not be, may not be aware of their blind spots. It's actually putting other people at risk. So they think they're coming in at service, but this person has to navigate that blind spot, that ignorance, that mm -hmm. history, as well as this. So there's a lot mm -hmm. going on there. That's what's fascinating about being an older female improviser <laughs> is that mm -hmm. you just, yeah, yeah, there's no quotes. I'm an older female improviser. And so I get, there's different, I'm treated differently on stage. I also stand up for myself more on stage. I also have been in improv shows where I've seen some shit going down and I get on up on that stage. I like throw the rule of don't enter the scene if you're not needed. And I'm like, someone's needed right now. <laughs> you got in, right? Like that's the kind of the exciting part of being a, an improviser that's not in her 20s or 30s anymore where you actually or being around where you just feel like yeah you need to like sometimes people come on and you need to be like you need mm. to set some boundaries for people it's still a murky Absolutely. landscape i have I'd a, like to... uh, oh i want to point out that sergio yeah. has tried to talk a couple of times as well oh i'm yeah, sorry okay. no 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 take it take it joe then we'll go to sergio yeah. Uh, uh, so my quick thing is just going back to, you said the rule of the annoyance is the best way to take care of your, your scene partner is to take care of yourself first. And so this is where the rule of trust your scene partner goes out the window, because the most important trust is trusting yourself to be able to deal for your scene partner, experienced, inexperienced, ignorant, whatever, what they can give, uh, what they give to you even in the worst circumstance. And and all of uh, the three women on the panel, like you're all strong badasses, it's that experience of seeing, no, here's the deal. Here's who I am. Here's who I am, the improviser. And here's the character I'm playing. But this character is being driven by an improviser who trusts themselves to deal with whatever you throw me and good luck. Because you can't fuck up my scene. Yeah, just before we go to Sergio, I would like to ask Christy, like just going back to the, the question that we were talking about in this like spotting uh, ego in, in other improvisers or in improvisers. How was it for you in like spotting maybe fear this guy's does ego uh, playing with non-improvisers. I will be a little bit curious about you talking about that. Uh, it's fascinating because fear, fear and ego are so, in, they're like vines that are entwined. And so when you sit across the table from, from a man that is very fearful, I can't have a good show with a man that's doing the show in fear because he's maybe he's afraid that his he'll be put down or that his ego will be cracked or you know what I mean like it is a thing where you have to cushion them to a certain to Elisa's point like to a certain point you need to make them feel safe because they need to be vulnerable in the show to a certain extent. Mm -hmm as all improvisers, this is what I, you know, I always teach. I'm like, you need, it's calm. Yeah, sure. You're at second city or whatever. And you were doing comedy, but you need to be vulnerable. And if you can't be vulnerable, it's very difficult to get the level of show that I enjoy doing. Same with improvisers. You can do a surface. It's like reading a book. You can read a book 
or watch a TV show and it's this and it's just entertainment, or you can read or watch the same thing and it's a much deeper experience. I'm much interested, I'm more interested in the deeper experience. So it is just about when sometimes, and I've done shows with men that they can never release the fear. They can never release the ego. I've done shows with men that it's ego driven on their part, the whole, let's say 50 minutes. Cause honestly the show is meant to be like 70 to 80, but with those, with that, I'm like, we got to cut yeah. it short. Cause I can't, you know what I mean? Like tick, tick, mama got things to do. Mama don't want to spend time with you. Um, but these people have paid. So there's that balance of, of, there's just some egos that you can't, you can't put at ease. Am, am I answering your question, Daniel? I'm so sorry. Yes, I think it's, it's very interesting to see, like in a way, how do we train ourselves to, to in a way, release that fear? Or, you have or... to make, you have to convince them or you have to bring them so into what you're doing with them civilian or improviser, that there's no audience. There's, we're not here for the audience. We are in a way, this is what a good improviser is. In the back of our brains, we know we're doing a show. We know we're spinning that plate. We know that we have to do our job. But the majority of our brain, there's no audience. We're not impressing people. We're not making people laugh. Mm -hmm. We're actually two human beings here to entertain hopefully each other in a way that's inclusive to all and that's is this, that is this mm -hmm. idea in a way uh, hearing you speak i think about this idea of entering the trance state like like you're so mm -hmm. much in in that that ego is kind of silent in a way yeah and as Maybe. long as it's not inside baseball or not just in, just between the two of us as long as it's based in humanity and and the involving all then the audience is going to be right on board with it yes yeah, a very cool thing to think about <laughs> <laughs> sergio Sergio, ¿quieres hablar acerca de, de esa idea de la impro y la, de la relación del ego y la improvisación? Eh, me gustaría solamente decir que, que el ego nos generó en esta charla uno de los lugares donde más todos queríamos participar. ¿no? Eh, el ego nos volvió muy presentes a todos y, y yo más que verlo como como un elemento externo, diría, es un elemento propio, ¿no? nos pertenece. Eh, más que, que pelearnos con el ego, plantearía eh, reconocerlo y, y en todo caso a la hora de improvisar eh, o, o a la hora de, de hablar sobre el ego, tratar de, de darle la dimensión que necesita, hay, hay, ¿Cuánto ego necesita cada momento de una historia? Eh, lo mismo que la timidez, ¿no? Como ponerlo como en el opuesto. Eh, más que juzgarlos, tenerlos como elementos que nos pertenecen, ¿no? Sergio is saying that he, for him is very curious to see once the subject of ego came out, eh, we were all very eager to participate. <laughs> it's a it's a thing that is there no it's part of us is what he's saying so instead of fighting with it he says it's important that we learn how to recognize ego and in a way bring it to its fair dimensions like mm -hmm. ego is there for a reason uh, the same thing he says with our shyness. Shyness is a word mm -hmm. of us being shy. Shy, like he is there for a reason. But we, in a way, we we could learn to synchronize ourselves with these with these forces uh, to use them in in our behalf. 
Uh, something else that Sergio said that specifically the direct translation is very interesting to me, um, especially like how Daniel was just translating it. Um, how he said specifically directly translated the ego belongs to us like it's something almost like that we if you do it right like and not that he said it this way but i feel like if you hear that it's almost like uh softening the vision of what the ego can do for us mm. in terms of like how we can how we can utilize it or ha harmonize yes Got I, that, I, Joe? I, trans I translated as is part of that of us yeah but what he literally said is yeah. ego belongs to us. Yeah. Mm. So I I think it's an inter it's interesting the translation this, the, mm. uh, what he's trying to say sounds like what Daniel is saying. Uh, what I what I hear is also the interest how interesting the the direct translation of the specific word that we don't you know you don't usually directly translate English and Spanish or languages, but it was interesting just to hear with my English brain that he's saying the ego belongs to us. Like it's, mm. it's part of belonging. So it was interesting. But Daniel is doing phenomenal. Thank you, Elise. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick up the topic of translation there. We've got a question here from Jamie Serta that has been asked in Spanish. So I'm going to try and read it. My Spanish is very ropey, so I apologize for butchering your beautiful language. Uh, but Jamie asks, ¿Cuándo ha usted improvisado con gente de otros idiomas y que le gusta de esas experiencias? Oh um, my God, Jim, you should you should talk Spanish more frequently. <laughs> you did so, that's really good. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. You will um, be very, very popular, I can I can say. <laughs> <laughs> because um, you also have this accent like when do usted está improvisando? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, la, 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 la. Uh, but I'm, I'll tell you what it means. It's saying please. when you're improvising with people that speak in a different language, what do you like about those experiences? Mm. I like how insignificant the language difference is. Me gusta lo insignificante que se vuelve la diferencia de no tener el mismo idioma. For me. Para yo. Para mí, eh, improvisar en, en un idioma que no conozco, eh, me lleva a la esencia de la impro que es eh, dedicarme a escuchar y, y como lo escuché alguna vez a Daniel Orrantia decirme yo me aprendía tres frases en alemán y esas tres frases las utilizaba indiscriminadamente en las improvisaciones y a veces funcionaban y si no funcionaban generaba mucho humor eh, pero me hacían pertenecer ¿no? Eh, Entonces, eh, no conocer el idioma creo que nos, nos hace estar muy atentos. Yo toda esta charla estoy tratando de, de leerlos, por ejemplo, a ustedes, eh, lo que dicen más allá de las palabras, porque al no entender todo lo que dicen, me obliga a, a, a escuchar eh, miradas, eh, emociones, eh, pequeños gestos, y nada, me hace estar muy presente, y le agradezco eso. Sergio says uh, that improvising in another language that he doesn't understand brings him to the essence of impro, that is listening. And he remembers a fantastic improviser that he met one time called Daniel Orrantia. That, <laughs> that said to him, Never uh, heard of him. <laughs> when I improvise in German, I learn three sentences. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. But when, but when they don't work or even when they do work, you feel like you're part of what is happening. You're part of something. And in a way, he, he feels that in, during this whole event, this whole talk, he has been trying to listen to us in ways that are not related to language because he doesn't understand language and he feels he's been part of this conversation and he's and he's been following what has been happening 
by how we express ourselves and in, in a plane that is not based in language, in spoken language. Mm. He also said that it makes him very present, which I thought was very interesting. Mm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Daniel is like, yeah, that's true. He didn't say that. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but I, I, because I, I, that when he said that last, I, I felt, I felt, and he said, I, it makes me more present and I'm grateful for that. So again, there does it, improv does it again. It does. I think it's, it's also related to what Joe was saying. I think that I, I am in the same vibe as Joe was. I want to play with everybody, mm -hmm. with everybody everywhere. It doesn't matter uh, their language, their nationality, their race, their... Even if I could play with Martians, I would love to do that. <laughs> and we will find a way somehow. <laughs> the, the, again, this strange, powerful force called improvisation finds a way of, of, of finding this connection. Mm. I would say that anybody who has improvised in their second or third language knows you don't have to be a neuroscience expert. If you're standing on stage trying to translate, you cannot be present with the other person. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can do, if when I play in French, there's French in there, I don't care what's right here in front of me. And when the words come from that part of your mind that is not anxious or fearful, but is that capacity to feel connection with someone, now the scene can happen. And you don't even need that many words. I don't have a second language, um, but I have improvised shows where I pretended I have. Um, and I've tried to improvise in German. I've tried to improvise in Spanish. I've tried to improvise in French. Um, and there's a couple of things that I observed in that experience. One was in a lot of impro exercises, we're trying to interrupt the intellect to get to a present moment where we're responding from another place. And when you are struggling with, I don't know this language, what well, your brain is, your, in, your intellect is interrupted because it's an overdrive and stuff starts coming out that is just going to be interpreted <laughs> however it's going to be interpreted. You're going to use a word. It's not the right word, but it is the right word because everybody's got you. You know, you, you really come into a different energetic space with the people that you're playing with. The second thing it taught me was the reverse experience of what people are experiencing when they come to an English festival. Um, that, you know, when they're put in an environment where they're 99% of the time functioning in second language what is going on, not just on stage, but in the workshops, in every interaction, go out for a drink, everything, the exhaustion and the fatigue of that amount of energy that individuals are contributing to be at that festival. And in that shared space of being, you know, in service of each other, how do I help with that? What can I contribute to the conversation to give some rest, something other? The third thing it, it taught me was the dominance of English. And it is the dominating language and the work internationally that other people are doing to make it easy for me. Um, you know, festivals were in countries where English is not first language and they will hold a festival and it will be predominantly in English so that I can participate. But the audience, the host company, the host improvisers, they're all in compromise so that my dominating language can exist. And I am really grateful for that hospitality and kindness. But I think I need to start stepping up and festivals in other countries have the right 
to ask English speaking people to step up. <laughs> it's time we find that middle ground. Send me a tape, help me learn, give me links. Um, you know, uh, I, I suggested to one festival that I would be very happy, you know, to come a week early if people would give me language lessons for a week. And then for the festival, I would just speak in that language. I would love to go through that experience because that's what other experience improvisers are going through when they come to a, a festival that changes their language for me. So anyway, those were three things that I have discovered. There's also, it's, it's nice that you're saying that because you you have been here and you have played in Spanish, the same as Joe and some mm -hmm. other people. And, and by watching, I have also felt a beautiful thing about not knowing, about just knowing a word. But suddenly that word, as simple as it is, table, you start to see all the potential of one word and all of the poetics that a chair or a paper or uh, anything holds within once we focus on making that thing work together. And, and from watching you guys play here in Colombia, when you come to Colombia, I have seen shows that uh, you're talking about salt. And the only word that you know is salt and arepa. <laughs> and, and somehow the, it's amazing. Like all you need is those two words and you see all the, how those words are charged with so many meanings that sometimes I feel that the audience is in a way asking, no, please don't learn Spanish. <laughs> please. <laughs> Don't, lo don't learn any Spanish. <laughs> Because if you learn a little bit more, this, this mm. sensitivity will, will be dead in a way, will, mm. will turn into another thing. So I think I have learned those things too. That's brilliant. It, for, for me, seeing people play in different languages like across languages, I find that it reignites curiosity for players who um, like they've learned their bag of tricks. They've made all these assumptions about like, if I say this, you're going to pick up on that. Great, great, great. And they've sort of narrowed themselves into like, this is what improvisation is. But then suddenly they can't rely on these tricks. They're on like, you know, <laughs> just say stuff and it's going to be said. So suddenly they're like, Oh, and they become more alive again as they rediscover the full set of the full range of motion of their joints um, and they uh, expand out again. I'm going to move on to one last question, which comes from Reese, which is as you uh, have traveled the world to different festivals, worked with different companies, do you notice new styles of improvisation? that form from the meeting of improvisers from different backgrounds and cultures. Like to, to talk about language for a section for a second, like uh, languages form when people from two different cultures, from two different language backgrounds come together, they'll create a, a, a pidgin language or they'll create a, a, a Creole and these are beautiful, fascinating languages. Um, what, what's the impro equivalent? What, what emerges at the middle of two different um, or, or multiple different uh, impro styles and cultures and backgrounds colliding? Anyone? I'll just say at, at festivals the last couple of years before the pandemic, I've as I was directing larger casts of people from everywhere, I insisted that everybody's mother tongue is invited into the show. Mm. And um, because of a lot of what we had just talked about, but there is online somewhere, there's a bat that we did in Greece. 
and there's seven different languages represented in the bat, which is the improv format that takes place in the dark. And at one point in the dark, they're doing a radio play version of a traffic jam and people with road rage in seven different languages screaming at each other in Athens. And the audience was out of their mind. And this, this thing that in, and a native tongue might have been like a 15 second bit literally goes on for five minutes. And it's just, and it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, like its own, it took on a life of its own. And it was just so fun that nobody cared about story. Nobody cared about character. It was just people yelling at each other in cars that nobody could see on a road that nobody could see in different languages because that's the human experience. And that's that's why I cried that day. Amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. There's also potential of, uh you know, altering games or exercises because you've got the gift of language. Uh, so at a festival in Leuven um, in Belgium, the audience was quite comfortable with English, uh, but we don't know Flemish. So um, having someone speak Flemish and then someone to translate it, yeah, come on in. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, and to have, uh, an English speaking person translating the Flemish. So the audience gets the beautiful Flemish poem, but then they get the English translation knowing that the person doesn't know Flemish. So they get that misinterpretation, but it's an honest, it, so it's not the interpretive game where you're trying to misinterpret, it's someone actually trying to interpret the poem and not knowing. Because there's that risk factor on the person doing the interpretation, it just, alters it a little bit in the mind of the audience because they're in on the joke. They're the ones that have the power of what is happening. They don't have to struggle for language. They get to go, ah, I have both. And I see you struggle with that because you are the improviser and I'm watching you make it up. And there's a lot of games you can do that have people whisper language in an ear and have someone who doesn't speak the language have to say the line that they're being told in that language, not knowing what they're saying. So there's so many different opportunities because it's a gift. A mí also, me pasa últimamente que eh, viajando, yendo a festivales, o, o, me, me está costando ver algo nuevo. Eh, no, no siento que haya algo nuevo, siento que, que hay como mucho más de lo mismo y, y por ahí lo nuevo que me ha sorprendido es lo simple, no, y, y, no porque está acá, pero voy a decir un festival que compartí con Patti en, en Portugal, un espectáculo de ella que, que, que era tan simple pero a su vez eh, generó profundidad. Entonces, a mí me sorprendía eso, ¿no? la, la, la posibilidad de, 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 de lo simple, eh, pero si no, en general siento que, 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 que hoy por hoy eh, hay una preocupación más por la forma que por buscar el contenido. Por ahí es una sensación muy personal, ¿no? Pero eh, ahora en, en Costa Rica lo hablábamos con Daniel, por ahí empezar a buscar la teatralidad en la impro, ¿no? No la impro como impro, sino la impro como un hecho teatral y tratar de ir más hacia ese lado, hacia dónde nos llevaría la teatralidad en la impro, que por ahí nos podría dar nuevas respuestas. So Sergio says, eh, as he travels around the world, he's been finding eh, more difficult to find new stuff new things that uh, are innovating. And, uh, but he has seen, he has been surprised by simple things. Simple sometimes it means more. He's, he talks about uh, a, a format that Paddy did in Portugal when, when they met. 
and how he was surprised that a simple format could be so charged with the with the meaning and he's interested interested in this in this discussion between form and content mm -hmm. and uh, he also mentions talking about how could improvisation be more theatrical again he was talking with this amazing improviser called daniel orrantia somewhere somehow <laughs> and and they were and they were curious about how could uh, more theatrical elements could be brought into improvisation and and to follow along with this answer i think that one of the the most interesting things about going to festivals is precisely this thing that Sergio is mentioning, like uh, having the time to sit down with Sergio and talking with him about uh, uh, what we think about uh, how the show begins and how the show could use uh, lights. Uh, so, so in a way, I think most of the things that are new for me are, or that grow out of these international meetings sometimes happen outside of the, of a stage. Sergio and I were, we were uh, sharing a room in a festival two weeks ago. And after, after the whole day was over, we were just in this room talking and talking and talking and talking about what happened and about what could be better so, so I think it is there where, where I have found lots of teachings and things that later on come back to what I'm working. Also, there are some phrases that, that become like this thing that I want to keep on exploring. Like I remember the very first time I met Joe, he was talking about this whole discussion between deciding and discovering. Mm -hmm. And I still today think a lot about that when I'm, when I'm thinking about how to approach improvisation. Well, I have discovered that we are out of time. So I'm going to decide <laughs> to wrap things up there. These conversations, like you say, could go on uh, mm. all day and they are so valuable, but we are out of time. So everyone, will you please thank all our guests, Joe Bill, Christy Bruce, Daniel Laurentia, Elise Rodriguez, and Sergio Paris, and my co-host with the co-most, Patty Styles, author, once again, of Improvise Freely. Uh, I'd also like to thank Impro Melbourne staff, Reese Terry and Panfred Reed, who've done some amazing work preparing this event. <laughs> so uh, everyone have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, night or morning, depending on where you are. And join us again in a month or so for the next Speak Freely um, with wonderful <laughs> guests from the Australasian region. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening, morning time. Uh, just have a good time. Um, Thanks we'll everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.